going to be talking now about how to choose schools and how not to choose schools. And I feel very strongly about this. And so I'm going to give you five things to look for when choosing your schools and five things uh, to avoid. Okay, let's begin with avoidance. Now, people in my experience who say, yes, we absolutely get this, are precisely the people who uh, forget it and who break all these rules. And the most important rule of all is dinner is for eating and for drinking, not for showing off about what school. How many of you have been at dinner and been really uh, with somebody who's been telling you about how marvellous their child's school is at? Hands up, anyone who's been at dinner like that. Guys, you need to get out more, right? You really need to get out more. I have spent my life with people who tell you uh, that uh, this or that school is absolutely marvellous and what do you want to do with them? Do you want to say, oh that's great, I'm going to send my child there or do you frankly want to punch them in the hooter? Because people, we, I think the most pernicious meal in the history of school selection is dinner and the dinner table circuit. And having run two schools, Brighton College, now brilliantly run for the last 10 years by Richard Cairns, uh, the most exciting head teacher in the country, and then Wellington College, which were two of the most demanded schools, were the two most improved schools in Britain. I was sick to death of people choosing the school because it was fashionable. Do not choose a school because it's fashionable. Point one, really, really, really don't recognize that you can profoundly mess up your child by choosing the wrong school. Here, who here thinks that they went to the wrong school? Hands up. Who here thinks they went to the right school? That shows what a very discerning audience you are. Do that to your children. About a third put their hands up again to the right school, about 10% said so they went to the wrong school, and the other 57% can't remember it so long ago. Second factor is don't choose what you want. Do not. It is not about you. If it's a fee-paying fee -paying school, I know that you will pay the fees, but that is simply tough. It is not about you. So 20 years as ahead, the parents who would worry me the most would be the ones who were choosing it for themselves. Thirdly, don't choose what you had. So uh, hands up here who went to a single-sex school. Hands up. And hands up who thinks single-sex is best. Okay, now of course you'd all put your, do not choose what you had. You know, all the parents I know who send their children, this has been very provocative, to single sex schools, often it's because they went to single sex schools and they'll justify it by things like saying, oh, well, they're better at results. Well, actually, no, they're not. They're just simply more selective. The uh, performance of the school has nothing. There is no evidence to suggest that the gender specificity of the school has any impact on the results. Okay, now there are great single-sex schools. There are fantastic single-sex girls' schools in Britain, and there are fantastic single-sex boys' schools. Amazing. And some of them have a co-ed in the sixth form and others aren't. There are lots of great reasons for choosing a single-sex school, but not because that's what you had, and that's the only model in your head. You have to be big people when making such a crucial, life-changing decision. Who here thinks that you were changed into the people you are profoundly by your school? Hands up. And hands up who thinks that they were not changed by their school. Everyone who didn't put their hands up, they put their hands up now. Okay. I think there are a lot of people here from Serbo-Croatia. Uh, all right. Okay. So. 
Schools need to be transformative places. They must be transformative, and if they're not, they're missing out. You who are choosing need to choose not what you had, but what your child needs. The fourth fact is league table positions. Hands up here who thinks that league tables are significant. Hands up who thinks they are a load of total tosh. Right, okay, having taken two schools towards the top of the league tables, they are tosh. They are pernicious. They are deceitful. They are loved by who? They're loved by two types of people. The head teachers who take their schools to the top, often by smashing up the school and the children in it, and creating a regime of fear to get the kids to the top of the league tables, and by newspapers who love it because it sells copies. Actually, you know, some of the best, best, best schools in the country, in the world, and I think that British schools are the best schools in the world, are in the middle or at the bottom of league tables. It therefore follows that some of the worst are at the top. And if you look at how miserable the kids are and how miserable the head is, you know, I mean, when did they ever get drunk? When did they ever, would you want to have dinner with that head? Would they make you laugh? Do they seem fun people to be with? And the, so league tables, you know, you know, choosing them on the basis of that, my experience is 50, 60 parents it's the dom percent of parents, it's the dominant characteristic. It's terribly sad. Nothing is sadder than where parents have chosen the wrong school for the wrong reasons. I'm giving you the right reasons if you're interested. And finally, don't choose the school because your child is going there with lots of friends. So I am going to St. John's because because all my best friends at school are, are going there. Lousy, lousy, lousy reason. Because you know, life, it's like, you know, at, at uni, at school, people who go, want to go to Durham, uh, or Cambridge, or Oxford, or better than all three of those, the University of Buckingham. Why? Because their friends have gone there. Terrible reason. I chose my, because I'm obviously a weak and very indecisive, person. Uh, I chose my senior school because my best friend called Tim Morn went to Tunbridge and I thought, wow, yes, we're going to be best mates forever and beyond. And, and you know, I fell out with Tim in the summer term before we even got there and we had a punch up and we spent five years ignoring each other and turning opposite ways down the corridor. And he, it's true, it's true. And Tim, if you're out there, uh, I love you and I want to kind of, you know, make amends and get us back together again. So choose it because, you know, it's a statement about the future. Life is about embracing the new and new experiences, not clinging to the people you've known in the past, isn't it? And, 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 and frankly, if they're great friends from the school they're at at the moment, when they go on to another school, you know, they'll stay best friends, if they really are best friends. Like, you know, your, your friends who, from school, your own friends who went to different unis, if they really were great friends, you keep great friends. So five things to do, then, if those are the five things not to do. Dinner table, not doing what you want, not doing what you had, not about league tables, and not what your children want if it's just about going to the same school as friends. Those are five things not to do, five things to do is what your current head teacher says. Now, uh, it's a proven fact that 89% of uh, junior heads make the right uh, decision for your child. 89%. All right, so you listen to these people very, very uh, clearly. Does anyone think here that that figure of 89% is made up? You are right, if you could all now, those people with their hands up can get a free pass to next year's, uh, to next year's exhibition, amazing, you know, and a free uh, year at your next school. Uh, so all you have to say is that Anthony Selms said that we can have a free year here, 
uh, with free uniform and everything, um, and free school trips, uh, because you put your hands up, fantastic. I made that figure up, totally, uh, but the point is that in my experience, by the way, most, I'm making a point really about a lot of education data, uh, which is spurious, um, in my experience, honest experience, the junior school heads, where your children currently are, often do know what's best for your child. Why would they not, and if they're any good, or it may not, if it's a much bigger school, it may be the head of senior schools or the head of whatever, but there are people at the current school who are often not listened to. So that's number one. Secondly, the head of the next school. You know, many heads, you've got to be at a school that you chime with the head. Uh, and many heads, as I was writing in the Times yesterday, are shrinking violence. I would have had just so much hate mail uh, from those heads who are shrinking violence for saying that truth, but because they're shrinking violence, they can't bear to write. So, you know, heads need to be real people. And sometimes they'll be quiet, and other times they'll be more noisy, but they need to be somebody you believe in. You need to believe in their integrity. Yes, I know that they can go, you sign up, and then they whiz off somewhere else, but they will have, if they're any good, they'll have left their mark. They need, listen to this, to be somebody who you believe in, somebody who you rate, who you think has real ethical, intellectual, moral quality. Third reason is look for a school that is going to truly develop the whole child, that is going to have that true holistic approach. You know, when I was at school, I was so keen on sport and I was never in a single team, not even in the rugby team. I wanted to be uh, number eight at rugby, which is a big bloke at the back of the scrum for non-rugby players. At the time, I was six foot eight. That was before my operation. And, 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 you know, I was never in a single team. I can't believe it. I was never in a play. I was never in any musical event. And yet that school sold itself as brilliant at sport, brilliant at the art, brilliant at everything. And it went on a single trip at the school. And you know, I've hated it ever since, and I've taken up so many lawsuits about it. No, seriously. I, 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 think, I think that at the time, that was what schools were like. You know, you had just one or maybe two teams. But look at the school. Look at what it's like for the not superstars. Because, you know, in all the brochures, on all the websites, it is the superstars. If your child is a superstar, well, bully for you. But most people don't have them, and they just want to be able to take part. And, you know, be in musicals, be in on trips, be in teams, join in, make things happen, be part of things. Is it a school that truly does that? Because, or does it a school that just does it for the superstars? Reason number four is um, your gut instinct. Now, how many of you here are in a uh, long-term relationship? Hands up. Okay, hands down. How many of you did that on the basis of a spreadsheet? This came actually up on The Archers this morning. The Archers is probably the best program uh, that you can listen to for choosing uh, your senior schools. Uh, and there's somebody there who was thinking about uh, a, a partner and dating and was sort of going through a spreadsheet. How many chose your partner on the basis of a spreadsheet? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, choosing a school is much more important than choosing a partner. Now, deep down, you know that. And none of you did it on the basis of spreadsheets and facts and quantitative data. It was on the basis of gut instinct. Trust your gut. It's an emotional feeling choosing the right school. Trust your child as long as they're doing it for the right reasons. I am a huge believer in gut and instinct and intuition. And finally, go for a school that has a real commitment to the community and to the world. You know, do they have lots of outside speakers? Are they really connected with the outside world? Do they get, you know, parents and other people in to talk? Is that really buzzy? Or is it just people who are kind of just really narrowly focused in? You know, because the best schools have porous walls. They are in touch with the whole world. They are hugely part of everything that has gone on. And 
that matters. So, those are the five things to do. The what your current head says, what the future head is like at the new school secondly, about the whole child for you know every child, not just the superstars, trusting your gut and how connected. And then you're know, just finally about happiness. Well, I mean, there are five reasons why happiness. But when at Wellington College we first started uh, 10 years ago, teaching happiness and everybody, particularly the Daily Mail, but the Telegraph and the Spectator, all thought this was just kind of shallow, psychobabble, drivel. Uh, and it was hugely exciting to be able to prove to them on their own league tables that would come up from 256 when I joined up to 21st on their table. No country had improved anything like that much ever in the history of, ta of league tables, despite the fact that we were leading on the uh, teaching of happiness and well-being. And something you'll remember from me, if nothing else, apart from the eye candy, that is, uh, is, is something you remember today is happy cows give the most milk. Okay? Why am I saying that? Well, I'm saying that because I love cows, uh, maybe, but also because it's true of schools. Happy children are the most productive. Happy companies are the most successful. Happy companies, organizations, will find it easier to recruit and retain staff and will have higher productivity. The companies that prioritize the well-being and the culture will uh, see their productivity rise. Companies that go all out for high productivity might see gains in the short term, but not sustainable into the medium and longer term. Fact, same as schools. Schools that really, truly care for the worth and individuality. And you know, a life is infinitely precious and infinitely equal. Nothing matters more. And what doesn't happen at school will often remain dormant for the rest of life. So, first reason is that the school will be much more productive and your child will be much more productive. Secondly, that you need the grounding for life. That what you learn at school about how to relate to yourself. I mean, you know, our bodies are fantastically complicated. None of us uh, would think about buying a car uh, and not knowing anything about how it works. Well, Mrs. Selden might, maybe, but that's because she's married to an amazing car, sort of engineering husband. But, you know, most people need to know how things work, and yet we're given our bodies we're given our minds, we're given our emotions, and nobody, not home nor school, tells us how these things work. And there is now so much science. And one other name to remember is Professor Marty Seligman, uh, the, the most famous psychologist in the world, Marty or Martin Seligman, has developed with his great teams of followers in the US and elsewhere, the science of positive education, deeply grounded in psychological research. We can teach people how to live, how to understand their emotions. Third reason why it matters is that the incidence of child neurosis is going up and up and up. And I run, now run a university, and it is a complete epidemic. People arrive at 18 incapable of looking after themselves. That's why, did you see those, uh, the stories in Durham? There were two stories last week of um, people who died of ecstasy, stories of Durham of, of totally drunken, debauched people. You know, at school we can tell people that getting wasted actually isn't such a clever thing to do. Actually, getting wasted is rather a prattish thing to do. Uh, uh, but, you know, they've got to understand that by a really great school that helps them recognize how they must take their own decisions in life rather than peer pressure taking their decisions for them. If they don't know that before they go to university, believe me, I run a university, they will not find it out at university. Next thing uh, that matters is that careers, when they go on to jobs, frankly, most kids uh, get, you know, two A's and a B or better at A level and they get two ones from Exeter or Durham or 
Coventry or wherever they go to, what really discriminates people is have they got the skills that they've learnt, the social skills which they would have learnt about at school. And do you know what? Do you know this amazing fact? Head teachers get no credit for the social skills and psychological skills they develop in their kids, but they do get massive credits and pay bonuses and better career prospects by driving up league tables. Which do you think they do? I don't need to answer that. And finally, uh, the final factor is that uh, it can be done. We now know so much more about how to bring up young people um, and look at Action for Happiness, which is a charity which I founded five years ago with Lord Layard, who's the government's happiness czar, and Jeff Mulgan, who uh, was for many years head of strategy in number 10. The three of us, five years ago, founded Action for Happiness that gives you, uh, everybody, the best uh, guided research into what we can do to help bring up people to be psychologically, mentally, and physically healthy and happy and have the strength because, you know, life is hard. One of our children is, is on Teach First, which is a, a, a program of teaching. It's really, really hard for him. Uh, and because I think he does have the gritty skills of resilience that he learnt at school, he is able to cope. Life will throw tragedy, it will throw, it will throw separations, it will throw redundancies, it will throw difficult stuff at us. We know this. And your school will be a great school if you choose it wisely that helps your child develop the psychological and mental skills to cope with the tough times because the tough times will come, not the least when you're not there to look after them.